Well, gosh, it's a privilege to be here, and um, hats off to the courage of Jeff and Rod for hosting this. And um, I have a little gift for them. I'll give them af after this. But what I want to share to you, the my title of my talk is To Then Own Self Be True. And, and what that is is a little bit about what CGMs will teach patients and even yourself. This is mostly going to be storytelling. I'm going to hold the science slides for if you want to go back later and pull up the this, this slides, which I will not be showing, which have about 20 scientific papers on CGMs. But it's 2 o'clock in the afternoon, so I'm going to try to keep it a little more lively. OK, disclosures. Uh, I own a little shoe store, and I wrote a book, and all the proceeds from the book go to my nonprofit. And so that's all I got for disclosures. Um, as far as food disclosure, um, I've been low carb uh, for about eight years now, since about 2012. Why CGMs? I like this one slide here. Well-controlled diabetes is the leading cause of nothing. So maybe let's take that away from this talk. How did I get into this space? It's a little bit of an unusual road. Um, so I'm just retired from the military 29 years in. And about year 2012, I was assigned to do a project for six months focusing on the military fitness test. I was a runner, and they had tightened the screws on the fitness test and they made a higher component of that test the run. And I dug into the obesity data and what was driving the failures, and I realized pretty quickly that it was obesity that was driving the failures, not a lack of running. And uh, at the same time, I was getting some of my own lab work done, and I had a C-peptide of 0.3 and A1C, a little above 6, and a high fasting glucose looking like this. And I started to dig into Gary Taubes' work and low-carb work, and it kind of all came together as like, wow, I got a little bit something like this thing. But for the obese patients who are failing their fitness tests, it's really more about them. But I went on the same kind of low-carb diet myself because my job in the Air Force is called a flight surgeon. And a flight surgeon uh, clears a f air crew to be able to continue duty. And if you have any diagnosable condition, basically you're pulled from duty. So if you're a pilot or an air crew and you're diagnosed with diabetes, you're gone, you're what's called a medical board, or if you're put on medications for diabetes, you're given a medical board. And I was at Wright-Patterson Air Force, and I had the, just the luck, I guess, at the time, I'd never even heard of these things. Um, they had a, an early model CGM, this is 2012, and I put one on for about three days. I was on a runner's diet prior to this time. You know, we all were just told, Doug Reynolds is here, you know, fellow a marathon or ultra marathon, or we would probably, you know, pound about 600 to 900 grams of carbs a day, and that's just the way it was. And I put that CGM on, and like half of my usual uh, salad bowl of breakfast, the glucose would go well above 200. And that was my last bowl of cereal. And I kept that A1C in that you know, fighting range to not be discharged uh, for the rest of my career. In the military, we have a term, and I think Jeff and Rod will get an award for this. We call it Semper Gumby. What that means is always flexible. So, there, so this whole weekend is we're all going to be kind of Semper Gumby mode. And that's what we're doing here, you know, juggling out speakers, you know, moving chairs around, you know, elbow bumping. So it's all good. I'm really privileged also to be speaking here, you know, uh, between two people that really are going to change the world and are changing the world. You know, so Brian Sanders, he didn't share with you that he also does decathlons. And he showed me last night a picture of him pole vaulting 13 feet. And Dr. Robert Lustig um, was uh, a lead in one of the grants that we did for medical students in 2013 or 14, teaching. It was, it was when Fat Chance was written. I call up Robert, and I was like, let's give the students this textbook. And it was accepted, and, and that's, like, that was a little bit rogue at the time. Yeah, this was my job in the military. We would train these guys called combat controllers and PJs. So these are the people that jump out of a plane. And these guys are all like paleo, not even knowing what it is, because they have to go like run and mark a target and run back to safety. Now, that could be a few hours, or it could be a few days, or it could be a few weeks. So these guys are like highly efficient people, and they're really fun to work with. So if that's part of your job, and your job is threatened, then um, you figure out how to get out of it. So this is all a work in progress. Who here right now is a work in progress? Has got issues. Okay, we're all a work in progress. So what works for someone else, just if it's not working for you, try something different. Um, you know, like like Robert. You know, I, you know, I, th I think what I've done in West Virginia is a little bit disruptive, and that's really, you know, if the consensus is the consensus is correct, we're not going to ever change anything. So you need dissenting opinions. So I followed a lot of the lead of UCSF. So we got sugar out of my hospital, sugar sweetened drinks. That was two years ago, and. Um, no one is, uh, I'm still here, no one is, you know, and really, it, you know, I know I'm speaking a little bit quick to get this done in 30 minutes, but uh, the only pushback I got was, why haven't you got rid of the diet sodas? So that's a good thing. Now, two years later, I'm in a 24-bed critical access hospital. 
But now it's, you know, the, our big hospital, the mothership is like 800 to 1,000 beds. But next week I'm on the phone with the lead there from their public health division because they wanna try to figure out how to do in the big hospital what we're doing in the small hospital. It is, it's, it's slow change. You know, if you have a little rock, it's easier to move. A big rock is more uh, difficult to move. This was about 2013. How many of you all work in a hospital and you know it's complete insanity to give a diabetes patient 60 grams of carbohydrates? Yeah, what's it do to their 10 grams of carbs will raise people's blood sugar 30 to 40 points. That's 10 grams. So we instituted these 10 gram carb meals and they're delicious. Patients love them. When I go into a West Virginia and I say, look, I can feed you eggs and bacon and some side salad, you know, I'll give you three eggs. How's that sound? Well, I'm good with that doc. Or, you know, is Brian, a, yeah, we'll cook you a ribeye or something. Yeah, this is, you know, this is good. This is not like extreme food. This looks pretty damn good. This is, am I, I go and hug my kid my kitchen staff, you know, because they're really, you empower your kitchen staff who are usually the lowest paid employees in your whole hospital who never feel like they're part of patient care. And you go down, you know, and say, gosh, that was an awesome lunch that you served, you know, Mr. Smith up there in 213, who has the diabetes, and then they take pride in it. Um, one of the issues with the hospital was these people were, you know, even within a three-day hospital stay, who's witnessed people go from like 200 units of insulin to like 10 while not exercising in a hospital, right? They're laying in bed and you just don't feed them the junk and, and their insulin needs go away. But then you have to find a place for them to go when they get out of the hospital. So we opened up this diabetes and metabolic health clinic in 2017, you know, with the blessing of our dean that we can teach low carbohydrate diets. And I have a colleague here with me today, Chrissy Van Hilst, who also is doing this method, you know, giving people options, but low carb is an option and this isn't rogue. We know now 2020 ADA guidelines, it's in the guidelines. You know, now we're gonna get into a little bit of technology. It's not that this new school of CGMs is the only way to go. I think old school is really good too. We'll do a little bit with old school. But yeah, I mean, there's variance in all these meters. I don't think there's any real gold standard. How many people have checked their sugars against multiple meters and multiple CGMs at the same time? And there's always a little bit of variance, but they give you information. And if patients aren't getting information in the way they can afford and use and access and is convenient for them without causing them discomfort, pain, you know, then they can, apply that information. Narrative medicine, has anyone heard of the term narrative medicine? How many of you all in your life, you know, have learned something from the stories of your patients, your parents, your friends, your grandparents, some tribal leader? Yeah, so uh, everything I think I've learned in medicine, I've learned from my patients. I may have a hypothesis, but if a patient doesn't do it or they do it and it's not working, then my hypothesis was wrong. You know, so these are old school. So let's just talk quickly about just glucometers, you know. So this uh, connecting to your patients is really powerful. People think I'm weird to give out my text message. But this is just with people using glucometers and actually checking their sugars. These are just little text threads. And most of these people had, you know, really full-blown diabetes. It's pretty unusual to have someone come to my, pa my clinic as a new patient with, a di with an A1C in a single digit. You know, usually they're like 10, 13 range, sometimes up to 15 range. Yeah, but they like this. You know, you can, yeah, great kayak trip, uh, finally hit 119. I mean, you just go, how many people have immediate access to their patients if they're reducing medications? Yeah, so if you're reducing meds, no one has woken me up at two in the morning wanting antibiotics for their kid or opiates or something at two. And they all respect that. If you give them a little bit of, you know, liberty to your time, they, they respect that for the most part. So these are people that have just used glucometers. Um, my friend Dim is part of the poster. He's two and a half years in now, 600 pounds prior, A1C of 15, creatinine of seven. Essentially, he's a well person now. He's a cop, coaches football, just got engaged, got promoted, lost close to 100 pounds. But he did a CGM without a CGM. This is 90 days, 400 readings. And you look at his variance. He uses an app called My Sugar, which is a very nice app. So that's one that's free that your patients can download to record their sugars. This is another uh, patient, his name is Colin, and he works for our VA, he's an army vet. And how many of y'all have heard of Livongo? Livongo, so Blue Cross Blue Shield is using Livongo, so basically it's a, it's a Bluetooth type uh, glucometer that's automatically loading your sugars. You don't have to write it down in a log book, log it onto your phone, it's automatically uploading your stuff into the cloud. And just in about, he's an army guy, so he's all in. In two months, his A1C went from 10 to 6, no meds for two months. He, uh, he leads kayak trips for the blind down in Florida, down around those mangrove trees. And now his energy is much better. Um, this is my friend Kenny's a bowler. He has a program uh, called Dario. Anyone heard of Dario? 
So Dario is another kind of technically savvy type of blood glucose monitoring. It goes right into your phone. The strip goes into your phone, and then it's automatically loading that data. It gives you wonderful charts. You know, it just, it's good. It's old school. He's checking himself like four times a day. Then you could go to the old school, old school. So this is Katie. She went from 10 to 6.3 metformin alone. She just came in with a sheet of what her sugars were, like a little scratch pad. You know, and, and she was fine doing there. Jeremiah's pretty obsessive with his sugars. You know, he writes them down everywhere. You know, he comes in with very detailed logs, 13 to 5.5 in about 10 months. And we declared him, we'll have patient days where we'll just say, this is a, you're now a well person. We'll kind of just bless them as they're a well person again. They're not on any meds. This is another well person, Michael. He's about 120 pounds down, not checking his sugars that much anymore because his A1C now is about 5.1 on no medications but they all started old school. This guy doesn't check his sugar at all, Will. He lays drywall and he wants to write a simple cookbook. Those little strips there are A1Cs. You know, they come out on a little printout and um, that A1C was like 5.4. He went from about an eight and he's on no medications. So these Libres, how many of you all have either prescribed or worn a CGM? some type of a CGM. I'm gonna focus mostly on the Libre here today because for our patients who are pre-diabetic, diabetic obese, this is a good entry level in. In the Q&A, if people wanna ask more about Dexcoms, Medtronic, and there might even be some endocrinologists in the room, but we're gonna hit just the basics of what does this do to empower patients? A really nice feature of these Libres, and I have my phone there, so I can look real time and see, I have about 25 patients now that have this on them, and I can see what's happening real time for breakfast. So if someone went off the rails, you know, so you see Michelle K there is a little bit off the rails, I could send her a message, what's going on, Michelle? And they usually know what's going on. And this little function here on the app is how they would share that with you. Has anyone used this? It's called Libre LinkUp. Anyone use that? It's free. And I, again, I can find me later and I'll show you how to do this stuff on your phone. So I'm going to talk now about what patients have told me about CGMs and what I've learned and why I think they're so powerful. So this lady's smiling and uh, her last 30-day average, so she doesn't have the phone, she has a reader and her last 30-day average was 130 and you see that 200 right there and you know I said Joanne what's up what did you have and she said oh I had these three small pancakes for breakfast. And uh, you know, she kind of saw that, but what was really, she was just smiling because the first time she, could, I said, when's the last time you were under 200 pounds? She honestly couldn't remember, you know, and she's lost a lot of this weight, but the CGM kind of barks at her and you probably won't eat the pancakes anymore. You know, this guy's an athlete, his name's Jason. He was in a couple weeks ago. Last A1C was eight down from 13, but his last like 14 days, he got the CGM about 14, 21 days ago. But if you look at what his numbers are doing now, he's on a low dose semaglutide and metformin, but he's all in and his next A1C, if he can keep that up, I think that screenshot was from like two days ago. He'll, he'll be good. I mean, he'll be like his next A1C will be in the fives. He'll be good. Erla, South Asian, you know, we'd have that with uh, Nadir this morning, the South Asian. She didn't even know what was going on until she was diagnosed with an A1C of about 12 at her initial diagnosis like 10 years ago. And she does night shift work and she has bad binge eating habits, especially with stress and coming off shift. And these are just some quotes they shared with me of, of why they like this. You know, when in a public area, convenient to use, no preparation needed, you can just swipe it. Happy not to be sticking my sugars often. How many people have stuck their sugars multiple, multiple times for multiple, multiple years? Yeah, it's, it's, just, it's a pain in the butt, right? It carries the things around you, you leave it somewhere. You know, before these CGMs, I'd be checking myself three times a day. And um, unless you really know what to do with that information, you just like, you get tired of it. Betsy was gonna be here, a good friend of mine. She lives in Oregon, couldn't make it for travel restrictions. She's gone from 400 pounds now to about 180 full-blown diabetes, A1C of 13. Um, her A1C started creeping up, so we got her a CGM. And uh, she's a technical person, so she's run a 100-mile race. She wrote a book, All Bets Are Off. She wrote a book, amazing book about binge eating disorder. She's half, uh, she would have been this morning when Rod said 100 pounds, a couple hands up. Anyone lost 200 pounds? She's kept 200 pounds off for about four years, five years now. Pretty amazing story. But she's fully diabetic. If she goes above 20 or 30 grams of carbs, her body will start gaining weight like right before your eyes. This is the craziness. I'm not an endocrine doc and I can't explain that 
but that's just terrifying. So her A1C started creeping up. She had a bad bike wreck, broke her collarbone, couldn't run in her weight. She got into kind of a panic mode. Now she's back running again, but this keeps her honest. She likes the technical side. So we're a little bit disruptive in West Virginia. We have dietitians actually acknowledging and doing low carb. This is Brooke and she helps with a low carb conference that we're gonna do in June. If anyone's local, I have some flyers over by my poster of a conference all day on low carb. Smoothies a surprise, you know, started to observe how much hungrier I felt when my blood sugar spiked and then fell off. How many of y'all have experienced that of worn a CGM if you have kind of this spike and then like an hour later you're kind of hangry? And you're like, oh, you gotta go grab something. But yeah, just to reaffirm the logic to stick with a pattern of eggs and veggies. This is a dietitian, you know, who's taught traditionally. Um, another dietitian in our state, Angel, um, she has a metabolic syndrome. I can't unsee what this continuous glucose monitor shows me every day. Now that I know, there's no going back. And these, it's great. These folks will go teach, you know, hundreds of other people in their communities in a state that's number one for obesity and diabetes in the, in the U.S. This is a patient came in um, a month ago, had an A1C of 15.9, um, pretty uh, high. And this, uh, her, her screen today is better. This was actually a little bad, uh, bad day. She got sick. But uh, so here's a couple things that she said. I, th I think this, what I highlighted here, is really powerful. Um, I had no intention of sticking my fingers to find out how awful my sugar was. Had an A1C of 15.6 told me that sugar was killing me. It did not change my attitude. Once I got my Libre, I really started using my insulin the way it was supposed to be used. I saw my sugar dropping gradually. And here she's, uh, she's lowering. She was on about, I think about 100 units total a day. Now she's on like 12 and 12 long acting. So she's also lowering the insulin at the same time. And we're on uh, text message usually every other day. You know, she got sick last week, we increased you know, by about uh, three to five, and she has some short acting for correction. So it's a work in progress, but from an A1C of 15.6, I forget, of nine, whatever it is. One of our pharmacy techs, so Rocky here, helps me order CGMs. In the Q&A, we can talk about some of the nuances about how to get these approved, what pathways, but we use durable medical equipment for most of the Freestyle Libres, as well as Dexcoms. And uh, you need to find a local pharmacy tech, you know, who works DME side, who can help and um, I was coming in with all these Libre, uh, you know, prescriptions and uh, she was full diabetic and uh, she said, can I come to your clinic and learn about these things? And this is like three months or something, yeah, 50 pounds off and her A1C is six. She's like a different person and uh, yeah, she'll teach them how to, you know, she'll be in the pharmacy when they pick them up now and she'll be able to teach people how to put them on which is pretty good. Sean, like some people are all in. How many of y'all have patients who some are all in and some are kind of like gently uh, tiptoe into the water? Yeah, so you got to work with both kinds. So this guy's all in. He was a collegiate soccer player. His A1C was 12. And uh, he, what I'm going to go full keto, right? <laughs> he's no halfway, right? So he's full keto. You know, I, he gave, I shared it with my friend Christy and I, a little thumb drive of all of his delicious recipes. It's like prosciutto wrapped bacon or something. It was delicious stuff. <laughs> but he's eating vegetables, he's eating crabs, but look at his sugars are like freaking perfect. He, he goes, he's so food addicted. He showed me his graphs like over the holidays. He went and visited like his cousin and they had all the, it, like two days, he was like totally, you know, getting shelled. And then he brought it back. He's like, okay, I'm back in now. It's after first of the year. So he's back on track. He's also lost about 50 pounds. One of our ICU nurses, so the nurses come around when we educate patients. And, and he started like, hmm, this makes some sense. So we got, you know, my friend Jared, a Libre, and yeah, he's a young guy, just finished nursing school, now he's an ICU nurse. A little bit of stress in that job. Any nurses, any ICU nurses here? Yeah, it's like you finally have time to eat, you're like wolf down some donuts at the nursing station. That was his, his pattern, a lot of night shift work. Met for, um, met, um, some aglutide, I think. How many of you all are using the GLP-1 meds? Yeah, that's like another whole talk, but there's a whole hormonal endocrine response in the satiety hormones and the gastric emptying of that medication in the right person who responds well to it. So that's, I think, just clinical experience of using that med, um, that category. Um, we tend to use more semaglutide. I don't know if there's more data on that one, but it seems like the satiety and appetite, that could be for Q&A, and maybe someone who knows more about the meds than I can dig into that question. 
Another vet here, so uh, in the VA, so we were able to kind of work the system and get Brian here a CGM, and uh, his A1C went from nine to six. He's the gentleman on the left there, and uh, he came in one day and he was less than 300 pounds, and kind of similar, he couldn't remember the last time he was under 300 pounds. Cheryl is another CGM wearer. She's had type one for 40 years, and the double diabetes, how many people are seeing the double diabetes? the type ones who are becoming type two physiology, really tough thing to treat. So she was on 60 units, so clearly the double diabetes, a lot of waste, and now she's on about 30 units of long acting and becoming a well type one di diabetes patient again. Um, another friend, uh, this is Victor, and this is his uh, family, his tribe. He was in the hospital with sepsis and A1C of 13, and now he's down to about seven going to the gym. Um, how many baseball fans here? So we call them one hitters, no hitters. I don't, I'm not sure who made that up, but it kind of makes sense. Yeah, so here's his, um, his uh, one hitter day. You know, I think that day he had a little bit of, yeah, V8, he had a little bit of tomato juice that day, you know, which sounds pretty good, but for him, no, it didn't work out too well. And then he had a series of kind of no hitter days, and he'll text me when he has these string of no hitter days. You know, I set his range at 150. Now you could set it at 180 and negotiate with the patient. He doesn't like freak out if it's above 150, but his goal is he wants to stay in that. That's his no hitter range. That's his goal because he knows he can stay in that range and he feels really good. His energy is good when he stays in that range. Now here's a, a lady, she was way off the rails and uh, she's a, a work in progress. She has her own chickens and her own eggs and delicious eggs. She'll bring in eggs to our clinic. But this is the effect if you have bad type two, we have this county fair. How many of y'all have been to a local rural county fair? That's like, you're just, that's a landmine city. She had one roll on some kind of food that they, food product that they would have at the fair. Look at how, how long that glucose spike stayed up. You know, in baseball terms, this would be called getting shelled. So you go into the, the county fair and it's a complete disaster. But then a few days later, yeah, she got back on track. But without this device, she would have just, oh, I just don't even want to know. I don't want to check my sugars. Yeah. Another gentleman, his A1C, 13 to 6. This is a husband of one of our nurses who brought some of our food list back. It's like, I think my husband needs to, to do this. And uh, he's a patient now, but... He did a lot of this just by his wife, who's a nurse, bringing back the information we were sharing with patients. He's a smart guy. He's an engineer type guy. Um, but uh, yeah, he's still a metformin, but, doing, but these are the people, these, this patient's fully diabetic. So his diabetes is in remission, right? He is not a non-diabetic, right? He is a full diabetic. His A1C is 5.8 now, metformin alone. But you see what day that is circled? Yeah, he got shelled with one Almond Joy. That's one Almond Joy. Yeah, Jack uh, here, he was kind of in line to get his dialysis, you know, almost uh, pre-op for a port. His, a his creatinine 1.4 now, but I like his comment about he likes the CGM because what he'll do if it's a little bit high, he'll walk it off. Instead of taking insulin, he'll just, he, he, he's a very 30-minute uh, walk will take his sugar from like 180 down to about 120, 130. So he knows, he has another strategy to bring his sugar down. Oh, gosh, I'll, you guys could read some of these stories later if you pull up the, uh, you know, the PDF of the talk, but some people get really obsessive with this because it just, you know, they're just constantly checking. These are more your type A's, but for them, they need this data. They love this data. You know, so here's a, a friend, A1C13. He comes to our clinic, a UVA grad. I'm a UVA grad. We like talking about basketball, which sadly we'll, we won't be able to defend this year uh, because they canceled the tournament. But he's reduced his Lantus to about 16 from 30. But his sugars are looking pretty good from an A1C of 13. His next A1C should be really good. A mom, busy mom of four, A1C 8, 5.4. This is what she says about the, uh, the CGM. It's so helpful to be able to monitor my sugar in a fast, convenient way. It also helped me see my trends and learn how better my body works. Um, and she has a normal mor morning rise. So this stuff's going national too. So here's two type one diabetes uh, uh, patients and, and clinicians. So Kerry Deulius and Andrew Kutnick and Dr. Jim McCarter there was one of the founders of Verta. So a lot of uh, hospitals are not allowing elective surgery to be done like spine surgery if your A1C is greater than seven or your BMI is greater than either 45 or 50. So we gave, a, I had to wear a tie at that one with the spine surgeons. But so they're looking for 
ways to help their patients meet these goals. And we gave about an hour workshop, and people stayed an hour for lunch break just to hear how do you do this practically. So uh, many of you all probably know Kerry. Um, this is Andrew. His website's really good. Go to his website. Just tons. He's a scientist. Um, he's working down in Florida now at the uh, Human Performance uh, Institute, IHMC, Mach Machine Cognition. Yeah, so he's a super smart guy, A1C 4.9. This is what his, his uh, CGM looks like in 90 days. That's freaking crazy. And he's, look at him, he's a beast. He works out like two hours a day. A little bit of my own experiment. So put one of these on yourself. You know, so a lot of times, one of the, t the landmines I see is when people go in and they're told that this is like a low carb or a healthy treat or, you know, a fat bomb or something. But it's got like a lot of hidden sugar. So these were four like little marble size, kind of had some nuts, coconut, a little bit of date that were kind of like low carbish, good for diabetes. And I said, I don't think so. And I had four of these little things and they were uber delicious because they had like erythritol or some sweetener. I could have eaten 20 of them, but I stopped at four and this is what it did. So that's probably not good for someone with diabetes. But when you start feeling like crapola is when you start d dipping down, you get that reactive hypoglycemia. We all know that fruit is wonderful and it's natural, but if you have any form of diabetes, I don't think it's a good thing to be eating very often. This is one mango, but it, this was worth it. This was a Florida mango, so that was delicious. And I don't think a little spike up like that every now and then is a problem, but if you did that like 12 times a day, week in, week out, there's a lot of papers showing that rapid fluctuation in glucose can cause endothelial injury, you know, more glycation. Um, slide of different fruits affect people different. How does a patient know what type of fruit affects them individually? Check their sugar. Yeah, but some people can eat bananas. I haven't seen too many diabetes patients who could, but maybe there's some out there. Reactive hypoglycemia. Has anyone ever trended their own reactive hypoglycemia or that in a patient? Yeah, so that's when you just kind of like have this peak, but then maybe you've got a little more robust second phase insulin response and you end up just going low, and that's when you just get kind of clammy and shaky and. And this is 4th of July, actually, so I had a little bit of fruit salad. It shot up, you know, to like 200 and then like really felt kind of hangry-ish later on in the night. Then I had a beer, which, which made it go up a little more, but that was in a safe range. It's 4th of July, right? What the hell? A good night's sleep and a good day kind of go together. So if you have a good day, how many people, their patients come in and their sleep is all rocky and their glucose is all rocky? But yeah, if you go in at night and your sugars are all rocky, your night's gonna be a mess. You probably won't sleep well, but people need to self-experiment. So if I have good days, I end up sleeping well. Hiking people and doing physical activity, people think, oh gosh, you need carbs or you're gonna get hypoglycemic. So this is, these are my kids in Glacier National Park. This is about an eight hour hike. You know, and you see, that's a pretty nice flat line there. You know, that was like, geez, we were out with seven, uh, gosh, seven hours, eight hours on the trail. And I had a little bit of cheese, a little bit of bacon, a little bit of nuts, a lot of electrolyte. And that just keep, that can stabilize your blood sugar. You need to get salt. But um, without the monitor, people make assumptions about these things. You can, if you travel, monitor teaches you what you can eat and not eat. Pretty much anything on a plane you can't eat. So I'll like smuggle in some TSA approved nuts and cheese and there's some of the grass fed cheddar. Exercise, how many who have worn a CGM see that their glucose is rise with exercise? Yeah, that's a good thing, that's normal, and that's okay. So, uh, yeah, so this is a, an ultra marathon. I, was wore, I wore this for a 50K trail race. If I had about 50 grams of carbs, and you're making a little glucose along the way, but certainly you're burning through, I think probably about six, 7,000 calories. If I had about 50 grams of carbs, and that little bottle there was my main carb source. So we're in the south and the mountain country. That's called Black, Black Watch Rise and Shine Moonshine. So it's got some nice uh, Kentucky bourbon in there and a little bit of caffeine. Actually, it's a West Virginia bourbon in there, but it's delicious and it keeps you going. This can happen too, but I don't think this is a bad thing. So if you go do some high, and Brian Letzky's talked about this. Um, you go do some high intensity stuff, your sugar will shoot up pretty high. But, oh, that's bad. I don't, I don't think that's bad if it comes right down. I mean, maybe don't do that every day, but doing some sprinting and, you know, hit stuff. You know, I think what happens, you know, so the hyperglycemia from the exercise, you're not really creating an insulin response to that as a hyperglycemia from food. So this is 10 cherries, and you see kind of almost like two similar spikes, but you see what happens after the fruit compared to running. Um, the fruit probably is gonna get you to be hungry and maybe make you a little more irritable later in the day. The Libre gives these really nice reports. 
30-day, 90-day report, so you can see kind of your time and range and you know, your morning trends. Most people who are low carb tend to trend higher in the mornings, and that's okay. You know, you see it in different formats. I'm not gonna go through all the practical tips of the Libre. We can hit that in the Q&A, you know, how you use these and apply them in the phone apps. The cost of these is not that much. It's about $60 for a two-week sensor if you go through a site called GoodRx. So even if people want to self-pay, this is the cost of insulin. So the newer synthetic insulins, you know, they can cost, you know, up to about, you know, a buck a unit. You know, 50 cents, 60 cents, 80 cents a unit. And you see these people dropping down from like 200 units of insulin. Even if they're still on some basal, which a lot of them are, you know, 20 units of basal, you do that month after month, that's a serious cost savings um, in insulin costs. So how do you put one of these things on? I made a video, but I can just show you right now how to put it on while I'm talking right here. It takes about 30 seconds to put one on. So I have one on my right arm now, and the one on my right arm is attached. I have a little tape and this holds it on, and if you look at what it is, it's just a little kind of rip this thing off my arm. It's just a little white coin sensor, and it's got a little filament that will insert with a little bit of a needle. So I've already cleaned my arm with some alcohol, but you could also put a little sticky, you know, like a benzoin type of skin prep. It's got a bottom base piece. You'd peel that. And people can self-apply these, and then you have this little plunger piece and you take that off, and it's got these two little gray lines that you line up. And the video will show you up close how to do it, but I'm just showing you up here how easy this is. And then I'd find a fleshy spot in my arm and just go, it's on. And I, I'll do this later. Just put some kind of uh, adhesive tape, a few little brands of adhesive tape. And then it takes it about an hour to warm up, and I'll cross-check it with my glucometer for like the first 12 hours. Um, they can be off a bit, so uh, yeah, so always be cross-checking, but that's it. It's ready to go. I don't know what that take, 30, 30 seconds? That's it, all right. Guardian, a couple other ones just really quick before I finish. Uh, Guardian has a seven-day sensor transmitter, more expensive. And this is a real CGM. This will alarm. You gotta calibrate it twice a day. So for, like for type ones who need an alarm, dosing insulin on it. This is FDA approved. Libre is not FDA approved for dosing insulin. Beautiful little screens. I have the app on my phone. And so you see, again, same kind of data. You see the sensors on this are a little bit wonky. If it goes kind of into a little, like a muscle tissue, it seems. I've bent a couple of these ones playing with it. So I've, I'm waiting for some improvements on this, but I'd be interested to hear more people's experience with the Medtronic. I think the Dexcom, you know, works super well. It's a 10-day sensor. Again, way more expensive. So if someone just wants to know for two or four weeks what their food responses are, and maybe they don't need to use it for the rest of their lives like a type one, you know, just give them a Libre for two or four weeks so they see that the bread makes their sugar to 300. After they've seen that happen about three times, they get it. You know, so the G6 is good. This is my niece. She's 14 now, got type one at age three, and she got her first CGM last summer. And you know, I'm not gonna read all this, but she really liked it, and it helped her A1C 7.5 down to 6.7, so that's pretty good teenage kiddo. You know, they've read Bernstein, so, but again, it's hard. So they, she can know all this stuff, but it's hard. And look at her time and range. You know, so that's August, and she's even doing better now. I, I, I was trying to get her to send me her most recent screenshot, but she's been busy. But yeah, so it's a work in progress. So I had one patient compare the Libre and the Dexcom at the same time. Um, again, pretty good. Yeah, so she has uh, Libre on one arm and the Dexcom sitting on her belly. And uh, they were usually within 10%. You know, you'd see this is the kind of side by side. Future CGMs, implantable CGMs are coming, but they do need a sensor. So, so if you think it's just like some little thing and you can carry your phone around, but they still need a sensor stuck over the transmitter, but it's, it's coming. Samsung is now getting into the space. So I think when more of these big technology companies are seeing the utility of this for non-diabetics even, you know, corporate people, you know, who are just, you know, trying to get more of that mental clarity stuff, you know, these are kind of like your hackers. Okay, so I'm gonna wrap up. Scientific articles, um, we have a, a share for, you know, when, when the conference wraps up, everyone can get 
these, and there's a whole bunch of articles you could look up. Practical tips. One of the things I think we need to be talking about is this diabetes distress, distress scale and how we can counsel patients. Um, everyone should read Bernstein because what the, yeah, I mean, he's great. Geez, the dude's still alive. He's changed, you know, reading his book has changed my life because I've learned so much and I've read it like three or four times every time you read it. Because the law of small numbers makes diabetes less distressful. If you have small doses of glucose, small doses of insulin, and small and stable changes in your blood sugar, your life's not distressed. You know, and that's minimally disruptive. So, you know, that approach is what we want to apply. This is a great book, too, Adam Brown, Bright Spots and Landmines. Don't do diabetes alone. Who else needs to be on your team if you're a clinician, health coach, friend? You know, they need someone to help them. This is difficult. You know, we know diabetes is complicated. We don't want to make it more complicated by intensifying the management. We want to make this less complicated by empowering them to do things that help them take care of themselves so they don't need you. Do you think it's just sugar, sleep, and exercise that affect glucose or a bunch of other things? You know, so there's like 42 things. I, this is half of the slide here. But there's so many things that affect blood sugar. When people wear CGMs, they're like, oh my gosh, when I'm on night shift, it's a mess. You know, when I don't get sleep, it's a mess. You know, medications. These are the two questions for diabetes distress scale. Uh, and you ask the, the patient, you know, do you often feel overwhelmed by the demands of living with diabetes? Yes. Do you often feel like a failure for not fully being able to take care of your diabetes the way that the doctors want you to? That's like always a yes, right? They always have this angst and guilt. And that's where they need you to help them. That's distressful. In your clinic visits, talk about bright spots. This is from Adam Brown's book. You know, what's working well for you? Well, my friend is hanging out and we're cooking low carb, or my buddies get me up to exercise. You know, my new job is less stressful. You know, I'm not going to grandma's anymore for cannolis. Landmines, and you all know what that is. It's like you walk into these places. Luckily, this conference doesn't have any landmines. Most medical conferences are loaded with landmines. Self-hypnosis. Um, have these things. So final thoughts. Okay, we're going to finish here. From the innovator's dilemma, there's disruptive technology. So people will think, oh, this is disruptive technology. So what is that? You know, it's something that can change, you know, the current paradigms. But what is sustainable technology or sustainable innovation? It's better performance than what was prior available. Who would disagree that a CGM is better, not better performance than checking yourself maybe once a day like most of these people? I mean, it's hard to argue that it's not better technology to get that information. Now we just need to bring it to the people. Yeah, so here's the final slide. Make fat great again. <laughs> <laughs>